to Stellenbosch this evening. Before we start, I'm just going to go through the rules. I just want to make sure that everyone enjoys the evening and gets the best out of the tasting. So if you just bear with me, I will remind you of what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. So here we go. To ensure that everyone can hear our hosts, all participants will be muted during the presentation. If you have any questions for the speakers, please use the chat function. And we absolutely would encourage you to send us questions because it makes the evening more fun. The chat function is at the bottom middle of your screen and will answer as many questions as possible. There'll also be a Q&A at the end. So if we don't get to your question, we'll do our very best to get, it, to get to your question at the end of the tasting. To get the best view of myself, Roloff and Victor, choose speaker view on the top right hand corner of your screen. We will be recording the tasting, but the, only the hosts are being recorded. So if you want to have your video on, by all means leave it on because you won't be recorded. Please remember to eat and drink plenty of water throughout the tasting, the best experience, and there's some food matches in the book, which we'll talk about later, but also have some nibbles and crackers on the side. We will send you a link tomorrow afternoon for those who want to view the tasting again or who couldn't make it this evening. And the final thing to mention is that we'll have a break after the second wine um, to allow you to top up on nibbles and water. So as I say, good evening again. Um, we're delighted to be joined by Victor Sperling, one of the owners of the family owned Delheim in Stellenbosch in South Africa and Roloff, who is the winemaker for Delheim. But um, before we start, we're going to um, have a bit of a movie, which is going to give us a really good overview of the estate. So I think the first thing to do is start with the Pinotage Rosé, and this is the 2021 vintage. This was obviously harvested in the spring of this year, and it's now in Ireland. So if everyone wants to pour themselves a glass of the Pinotage and sit back and relax and enjoy a couple of minutes of the movie from Delheim. Roloff's in charge of the, um, the movie. These are the oldest wine growing soils in the world. Cool air from the Atlantic Ocean moves through the vineyards high up on the Simonsburg Mountains in Stellenbosch, South Africa. Formed 500 million years ago, these are the vineyards of Delheim Wine Estate. For four generations, the family has served as custodians of these soils, crafting exceptional wines in harmony with nature and with respect for the people who live and work on the farm. The estate was purchased in 1939 by Hans and Deli Huheisen, and by 1944, the original cellar was completed. But it was when 20-year-old Michael Sperling arrived from Germany when Dalheim really became part of South African winemaking history. Deli Huheisen's nephew had no formal training in winemaking or viticulture, but Spatz, as he was fondly known, was infatuated with the beauty and the potential of the farm and its environment. Following his passion, Dalheim became a pioneer in the South African wine tourism industry, acting as a founding member of the Stellenbosch Wine Roots in 1971, the first wine roots in the country. Today, his son and daughter, Victor and Nora, with their families, are continuing to build on the rich legacy left by their father. And for them, winemaking needs to happen in a sustainable way. 150 hectares of the estate is under vines, while the other half is home to critically endangered natural Welland granite vine horse vegetation. It is also one of the World Wildlife Fund's biodiversity champions, a select group of 50 South African wine farms who actively conserve their biodiversity in tandem with wine farming. Leopards, caracal, and many other animals roam freely on the farm and are protected through the conservation management plan. Furthermore, Dalheim is driven by a respect for the people who work on the farm and social development takes top priority. Endorsed by the Wine Industry Ethical Trade Accreditation, 
These efforts include a crash, youth education, learnerships, internships, and skills development. Each glass of Dalheim's internationally awarded wines reflects this passion and diligence. Here, wine is made in the vineyards with viticulture practices supporting this fundamental belief. All activities from pruning to harvesting are done by hand, ensuring that only the highest quality grapes get delivered to the cellar. Wine making skills and knowledge then work together with modern technology to craft elegant wines that truly reflect this exceptional region at the southern tip of Africa. Each bottle of Dalheim wine reflects this story, this heritage, and this commitment to future generations. It captures the soil, the sun spilling over the mountain peaks, the wind dancing through the vineyards, coming together in unique, enticing aromas and wines of character. Travel with us. It's worth the journey. Thank you very much, Roloff. That's the first time that we've had a video of the estate in one of our tastings. And it really helps to give a sense of the place and what a special place it is. I mean, I know, Victor, that you've been very instrumental in the development. I know you were very involved in the viticulture of the estate, but you've also been very involved in the change to giving land over to the biodiversity of the animals and the ecosystem, if you like, within the estate. Would you mind giving us a, a you know a bit of background on that? Victor's on mute. Aaron. Thank you. Okay, there, Sorry, well, Victor. Apologies. I can't do that myself. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> We're control freaks. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the love for the biodiversity and um, nature has pretty much come from my father when he came from Europe. And uh, a lot of the land that we have at Dalam is not easily um, cultivated for vineyard. So being a German, he said that all the land had to be cultivated. And he started to plant pine trees on it. But... Um, he also soon realized that uh, because we're lying up against the Simonsburg mountain, so everything above us, our state is natural fainbos. And um, yeah, that we also needed to preserve some of this. So we were one of the founder members of the BWI, which is the Biodiversity and Wine Initiative, where we started to say that we should give back a certain percentage of our land that we have to nature. Um, and that included um, putting corridors between our vineyards where insects and animals can roam freely between the vineyards because a vineyard is quite a sterile environment for any natural predators or insects and um, if you put corridors in you have space for these insects and animals to live in the natural environment and they help with um, getting rid of the that we would otherwise have to spray. And um, Delheim being up in the mountain and having so much fan boss around us, we can actually see it compared to our other farm, which is the below, um, further below, the, uh, closer to Kronenkop, um, where we have very little fan boss. Now we have a lot more, but we used to have much less, that we have a lot more insect problems. So the nat giving back to nature and making space for the the natural um, habitation of predators and other animals actually helps yeah, in the biodiversity of the vineyard. Okay. And a monoculture is, from a vineyard point of view, is historically how vineyards have been planned and planted. So how hard was it to then bring in other indigenous or re-introduce re, um, indigenous plants and you know, bushes and trees and so on. Did you have to remove some vineyards to do that? Yeah, so in the olden days, we used to have windbreaks between vineyards, which took okay. up a, a lot of space. Uh, when we took out the trees down, we let them lie flat and then they start rotting. And with the rotting, uh, you start getting all kinds of insects to come in to eat the wood, to make nests inside the wood and take up habitation inside these spaces because you're not driving there with tractors or 
spraying anything there that mm. they've got a space where they can live all year round without being disturbed. Um, and if you put these spaces in between vineyards um, blocks, then um, the, vine the, the insects and animals can travel between blocks and to natural environments without having to travel through a monoculture like a vineyard. Mm. Mm. And it's, it's, it's organic is probably the way that everybody would like to go, but organic is not always the way that it's sustainable um, mm. to, to everybody. And um, at the moment, growing organically 100% and trying to do it at a, at a price that, is, um, that works for the consumer is, is very, very difficult. Mm. So we said rather let's look and, and start to wo work, work towards that and do it in a more sustainable sustainable way. Okay, interesting. We might come back to that point afterwards. As you say, it's, it's the way that a lot of people would like to work, but it's not always possible for weather reasons or, as you say, the difficulty of trying to um, still offer good value. So, um, no, roll off. So then just, uh, so, it's interesting that South Africa is the only, only wine country in the world that has a sustainable winemaking um, business um, ethic like the BWI, which actually comes and monitors your status, gives you points, and you actually become a champion. Um, we are only, I think there's at the moment, only 20 wine farms in South Africa who's got championship status, which we are one of. Um, For biodiversity. So it's, something, yeah, so it's something very unique that we do, and Australia and New Zealand are starting to copy us. Okay, interesting. So there's only 20 South African wineries who are by currently accredited as biodiversity champions. And you were one of the first, weren't you? Ourselves and um, Rustenburg and Fergelegen uh, were the first three. Okay, okay, interesting. It's amazing, we could talk about this all night, but let's talk about the wine because I'm sure people want to hear about the, the Delheim Rosé. So this is a Pinotage Rosé. And Roloff, obviously you're the winemaker at Delheim. So we would love to hear your interpretation or your philosophy of the type of rosé that you're trying to make from Pinotage, which incidentally was one of the first and most well-known and highly respected rosé wines in South Africa. When was this wine first made, the first vintage of this wine? That's a good question. I think Victor could tell you, give you that answer. Victor, when was your first rosé wine made? 74. 1974. So we're really in Ireland, we're just getting into rosé now, but you've been making rosé since 1974. So um, we'd love to hear what your um, winemaking philosophy is, Roloff, and um, even just a bit about this, the 2021 vintage would be interesting. Yeah, um, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, look, to be honest, I think that my whole philosophy is kind of to put everything you saw in that video into the bottle. Um, and, you know, how do you do that? It's, it's not very easy. I think 90% of the job gets done in the vineyards. Uh, I think the 10%, the most important part gets done in the cellar. Um, but it's, 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 it's something that, you know, it, it's so much planning. You know, we're not planning for 2022. We've already, we're already planning for 2024, 2025, and what we want to do and how we want to achieve it. And in terms of wine, um, especially the rosé because well we started the pinotage rosé in south africa in the world if you can actually say that so you know we've got a reputation and we have to stick to it so um we want to put what you saw in that video into a bottle and it's it's got to represent what we're trying to do and it's weird that i say that but it's not actually because um the rosé uh, not only do we look after the vineyards, the way we make the wine, all our wines from 2019 are vegan friendly, just our natural our approach and the mindset of everything we do is, you know, you've got this time in the world where technology is at a point where your natural products are just as good as the ones that they literally synthesize in labs, if I can say that. So the tools are there to be as organic as possible and as efficient as possible. And it's not an overnight thing, it's, it takes time, it takes a, a couple of years to really get into it and develop um, your wine, your product to what you want it to be. Um, but yeah, no, my philosophy on wine in general is identity. Um, you know, I was actually asked that yesterday about old wines and I said, look, I, I'm a winemaker, I drink young wines, I love identity, I like picking up the glass and smelling 
Simonsburg Cabernet Sauvignon or any, you know, it must, it must tell me what it is. And that to me is very important. And um, Rosé, it's, it's, I've got a love-hate relationship with it because I spend so much time on this Rosé and it's, you know, it's, it's a fun, you know, easy drinking wine, but there's so much attention to detail when it comes to Rosé. I think it's, it's, of all the wines, it's the one that's the most cosmetic, where the color influences the, the consumer. You know, everything, every little aspect of rosé is so important. And, you know, for Dallin, we don't really make rosé on the side at all. We're not a producer that bleeds off red juice from Merlot or Shiraz or whatever it might be. Can we make rosé from that? We actually have this mindset. We go into it and we make the best rosé. I mean, there's you're drinking 100% free root free juice, free run, rosé wine. Um, at that price point, it's just ridiculously good value. Um, it's also wine. beautiful pale color as well. Yeah, you know, I, everyone's asked me well, how I did describe the color and, you know, yeah, I just call it, it's pinotage pink. There's no other cultivar that gives you this color at all. Um, it's just, it's pinotage pink. Um, yeah. And this year, 2021, I think the free run juice, uh, we, this is off the back of 2020, which was a fantastic year. I think 20, it, because we're getting the water again, the environment's coming back, the vineyard practices we're doing, everything we're putting into it and it's snowballing and we're just building a lot of momentum. And I think 2021 Rosé is is pretty much a testament to what we've been doing. Um, so yeah, but it's, it's free run juice. We get it into the press as quick as possible. I don't really do a lot of skin contact. The skin contact is practically from when the fruit gets into when the press is for what press. And that's okay. free run juice go straight into the tank. Uh, what we do is we float it to make sure that we get the cleanest juice we possibly, possibly can, put it into the tank, and then I ferment it really, really cold. I mean, it just locks in those flavors. Pinotage is one of those, well, one of those. It is the cultivar, I think, that ferments the fastest out of anything. You can ferment it 13 degrees, you can ferment it 50 degrees, it will ferment in three to four days. So you really got to go spend a lot of time and attention to make sure that what you're trying to do happens over a very short period of time. Okay. Um, it's also, it ripens a lot earlier than all the other reds, which is great for uh, rosé because it slots in right at the beginning of the year before we really kick off with all the whites. And I just 100% mm -hmm. focus on the pinotage rosé. And uh, yeah, 2021, when you get the vineyard practices right, when the weather plays along, you get your rain, um, you know, you, <laughs> the life's... Uh, dealt you a really good hand and yeah that's really the the 21 in a nutshell yeah no it's delicious and um those cooler fermentation temperatures are obviously important for the retention of the aromas and the primary fruit on the palate we were just chatting today um at work about the fact that a winemaker maybe gets 40 chances in his life to make a wine or 50 chances if he's very very lucky and it's incredible to think, if you think that you get the opportunity to make the wine once a year and you'll get a chance to do your job 40 or 50 times um, compared to most jobs, which you're basically doing it day in and day out. And, you know, it's your, your chance to get it right is once a year. So I think you've definitely got it right. The 21 is absolutely delicious, I think. Um, and I'd like to hear from anyone who has tried the food matches that we suggested because the food matches have come from um, Victor and Roloff. So I don't know if anyone tried their own food matches with Rosie or they went with some of the food matches that we suggested in the tasting booklet, but we'd love to hear from you if you, um, and I can see some of you are quite rightly sitting outside eating your dinner along to the tasting, which is great. But um, any any thoughts on the food matches for the rosé? Would it would be good to um, it would be good to know. So um, thank you thank you for that roll off. Um, we've got a comment there saying stunning. Um, so the next time we're going to move on to the shaman, and um, maybe Victor, you could tell us a bit about the um, your social program at Delheim because you do have. Um, uh, uh, a kindergarten for your workers' children, and you have workers on the, who live at, on the estate, don't you, and have their own gardens and so on. It's a very strong ethos at the winery, isn't it? Yeah, Lynn, it's um, 
because uh, it's quite South Africa is a bit different in Europe where your yeah. community that works on the property lives on the property away from the actual town. So all your um, normal creches and after schools and school facilities are normally far away. Um, and at the time, Deland was progressive in with my father who said, you know, it's important to give people the opportunity, if, uh, even if it's that far away from town. And we were the second winery after um, Tweon Gazellen, um, who started a community um, crash after school and um, had a proper crash teacher and proper facilities put in place for these kind of things. And I think if I look back now, 30 years and more, um, then it's amazing how much uh, it has helped us to deal with problems with other properties have got now, other farms have got now. Uh -huh. Because um, if you help people to have a happy environment, a happy space um, to work in, and they know their children are being looked after and while they're at work and the children have a future because they've, they can actually go to proper schools afterwards with good upbringing and it, it makes the whole environment better. We're a family mm. winery you know, and we consider everybody who lives on the property and comes to work here as part of the family. Um, and uh, if you keep the family happy, then hopefully everybody's happy. And it was very forward thinking and um, I suppose against the trend at the time. Um, and it's a very, um, you know, it's impressive that it is such a strong ethos of Delheim, um, that it's, uh, it's in place for your workers and their families. And, and, yeah. and is, it the, is, is there's kind of generational thing that family, one, you know, a dad works for you and then the son might work for you and so on, is do you tend to find that your family stay with you through generations? It's funny that um, as soon as you uplift people in that way, the families become smaller. Okay. Um, they become, they want to be more than just a tractor driver. They want to be a tractor driver and more. So okay. the skills level become better. So they do more things. So most of the people who live on the property now are not your normal um, laborer that you would use. They're all very skilled workers because okay. that's how we, how we educated them and how we brought them up and lifted them. So funny enough, today you will have um, your normal pruning work will not be done by your people that are your permanent force because okay. these are your skilled workers. And they've, the mentality and the way they look at the brand and the way they live the brand is very different to what it used to be. Okay, interesting. Um, interesting. Yeah. Which is so, it's positive and it's positive because it's, it up, up, uplifts the, the work ethos on, the, on, on, on our estate. Okay, okay, interesting. So the second, I mean, the second wine this evening then is the Chenin Blanc. And sorry, I have to apologize. Apparently there's been some technical issues with the Zoom link. Um, I hope that everyone who was supposed to join has been able to join now. We'll also be sending the recording out tomorrow, but apologies for people who may have missed the beginning of the tasting because the Zoom link was not connecting. So sorry about that. Okay, so then the Chenin Blanc then is the next wine, which is the Wild Ferment Chenin. And this is the 2019, and it's the second wine on the tasting this evening. And um, you can see with a couple of awards for this wine. Um, and roll off, interestingly enough, is the winemaker at Delheim now, but prior to Delheim, he worked at Roost and Breda, which is actually also one of our, um, one of our other South African wineries. And um, the wine trade is a bit like Ireland in so far as that everyone knows each other. So it's, um, that was where Roloff previously worked, but he's now been working at Delheim for some time. And this Shannon um, Blanc um, Wild Ferment, I think is one of the wines that he's really, um, really brought his own um, touch to over the last couple of years. And um, I'd love you to talk us through the Shannon Roloff, if you don't mind. Yeah, uh, no, Shannon Blanc, in general in South Africa is becoming a powerhouse cultivar. It's just really, it's something we do exceptionally well and even more so in Stellenbosch. And um, 
I'm very privileged to have taken over vineyards that were planted 35 plus years ago. So I'm, I'm reaping the benefits only now. Um, and my whole reasoning behind what I do with the wild ferment is I focus on the older vineyards. Um, my theory there is younger vineyards, or let's sort of start, older vineyards are like your, your, your grandfather or that uncle that when you're sitting around the campfire or the fire at home, listening to stories, they just, you know, they've done everything. They've just had stories for days. Um, and that's what really older vineyards are, where younger vineyards, you know, it's kind of like kids that you got to send to school. You kind of still have to mold. You have to kind of push them in a the direction, if I can put it in that sense. So um, the reason why I use the older vineyards is it's a spontaneous fermentation, a wild fermentation. There's not much I can tell the wine or the grapes. Those vineyards are 35 plus years old. Their roots are deep. They've seen things. Um, they can tell me a story. So I let them do their own thing. It's spontaneous fermentation. It ferments in oak barrels. Uh, you now have concrete egg tanks that we're fermenting in. We've got a lot of projects. It's just, you know, to, to just add more layer and more complexity to the wine because it, it is a bit more of a serious and blunt than what most people would expect. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's what keeps me up at night. It's a high risk wine when you just let it do its own thing, you know, not, it doesn't necessarily always equal success, but I think when you've got the right vineyards and you've had experience with it, you know where to put it and what to do with it. And uh, I mean, the fermentation, some barrels ferment in three days, some ferment in three weeks, some ferment in three months. Um, and you put the same juice into 20 different barrels, you get 20 different wines. And I mean, that just adds so much complexity to the wine, so many layers. Um, you know, I, I enjoy opening my bottle of wild ferment three days before I drink it. Um, I can do that because I have a supply of wild ferment. So I can open more than one, put it in the fridge three days later. It's just, it's developed into this beautiful wine. Um, it's almost completely different to how I make the rosé. This doesn't, this sees oxygen from the moment it gets, comes into the cellar. I, I'm not trying to be reductive. I give it oxygen, but not forcefully give it oxygen. I don't try and protect it from ox uh, oxygen. It goes into barrels. It sometimes takes a week to even start fermenting, you know, and in that time it's taking up oxygen. And I think that's very important for the style of wine's development because um, it's seen oxygen, it's had oxygen, it's developed with oxygen. You know, you can open the bottle, you can drink it. it I mean, if you open a bottle of Sauvignon Blanc, that's the first time it really sees oxygen in its life. And then the next day the wine's flat or it's dead. Um, it's just, it's, it's a different way of making the wine and Chenin Blanc lends itself to that as well. I mean, it's such a diverse cultivar. You can make sparkling wine, you can make big fat Chardonnay style Chenin Blancs. You can make, well, they actually told us never to use this phrase, but you can make a Sauvignon Blanc style Chenin Blanc. You know, it's just, it's so diverse and sweet. Uh, straw wine, just name it. Mm. Chenin Blanc can do it, maybe not a red wine. Um, it's just, it's just such a good thing to make. And I, um, the vineyards we have at Dalheim, it's, it's, oh, I just, I, I, I do a good hand. <laughs> 35 year old <laughs> Chenin Blanc vineyards. It mm. made its own wine. Um, it's, yeah, you know, with the wine's bad, it's the vineyards. If the wine's good, it's the winemaker. So, <laughs> <laughs> I have to give Victor his, uh, his view. They, they, they did a great job in the vineyards. It's just, it makes my life so much easier. Um, mm. when we taste through all the barrels and we taste the concrete eggs and we taste just fermented in concrete tanks it's every single wine is like oh we could probably put this in the bottle on its own but when you start doing the blending and you see the layers it adds and how the wine fleshes out and how it comes alive it's uh, it's just a fun wine to make it really is it's quite it's quite textural as well listen to it roll off on the palate you've got a bit of um weight there on the palate in terms of texture haven't you yeah. And that's I mean, the great, but do you think that's the wild yeast fermentation as well? Yeah, I think that's a lot to do with it because it spends a lot of time on the lease. Um, uh -huh. And, you know, it, I always describe it as an oiliness. And in a weird way, it also has a sweet section, but the wine's bone dry. You know, it's, yeah. that's how the layering comes through. That's how um, a stainless steel fermented Shannon where it's just clean and crisp and clear versus a wild ferment where you've just got, you know, every sip you take is a different experience you have a sip eat it with food i mean it's a food wine really it's uh -huh. you, can just, you can just it just lends to so many different things and it will change drinking okay. the wine out of the fridge versus having it at uh room temperature it's two different wines you know yeah 
And I, I, it's interesting what you say. It's almost like a sweetness is a sort of, even though the wine is dry, um, there's a kind of textural honeyed character to the wine, which makes it, I think, a really good wine to match with food. Um, and I think it's quite interesting because we're seeing um, a bit of a move away from very lean, dry styles um, towards more textural white wines. And I think it's because people have been cooking at home more over the lockdowns and they're looking for wines that are going to match the dishes that they're making at home. So in a sense, they're maybe looking for more restaurant style wines to drink in the house to match their dishes. And I think this is a perfect example of a wine that's just, as you say, it's delicious in its own, but it's absolutely amazing with food because it's got so much to offer in terms of the texture, the complexity, the layers of aromas and flavors. And I think that, um, you know, I think that would work um, very well, you know, with food. Now, you must tell us what um, lobster burger is because you told us to match this with lobster burger, but I don't know what a lobster burger is. I wanted to say crayfish burger, but I'm not sure you get crayfish in. You know, we could get our hands on lobster easier, certainly. Yeah, so I went that direction. I'm assuming they're the same. We just eat crayfish in this country. I think Victor, uh, he's promised to take me diving every year. Uh, still waiting. Um, and he's not done it yet, though. No? He must or, still. He must first learn to dive, bro. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm scared of the ocean. I won't go that. <laughs> oh, really? No, it's it's, it's uh, your your um, diving season. It's it's practically open two to three times a year. Um, and it's, I know we're crazy about crayfish in this country and just to have um, crayfish tail, let's call it lobster tail, on a burger with really nice mayonnaise. It sounds nice. It is. Sounds I'm glad I ate before this because I'd be dying right now. Yeah. Could we have some chips as well with it? <laughs> of course. <laughs> I know Paul a few weeks ago um, did lobster chips and mayonnaise and I just thought that sounded like a match made in heaven so um, add, add a bit of balsamic vinegar to the mayonnaise you see what that does Ooh, to the lobster interesting. that sounds interesting mm. and the other thing that you suggested to go with the with Shannon was uh, sushi which also sounds delicious yeah funny enough um, we quite, we were sushi crazy in this country uh huh um, Every other restaurant is a sushi restaurant. So, um, yeah, nine times out of ten, if I had to go eat sushi, or oh, we do a lot of uh, coffee, we take bottles of wine in Stellenbosch to the restaurant. I think it's like an unwritten rule in, in the wine region. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I always take wild fermented when we do mm. sushi. Fair play. That's a good one to take, I'd say. <laughs> so, um, Jeff um, is recommending it with Dublin Bay Prawn. So similar, I suppose, to what you're saying, Roloff, it's good with that kind of, you know, that luxury prawn lobster. Um, I think that's a, an interesting one. And in a way, I suppose there's a bit of sweetness in the prawn and there's a bit of sweetness in lobster. And you're talking about a slightly honeyed character in the Shannon. So I think those would be very complimentary. So um, sounds like sounds like a plan. Thanks oh, yeah. for that. Listen, we're just going to take a break for a couple of minutes to let people top up on wine, top up on water, top up on nibbles or on lobster burger. Um, and we'll be back in a couple of minutes it's just to give you a chance to um, make sure that you've got everything you need for the next part of the tasting. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. OK, so a um, couple of more food suggestions here. Um, Alexander was saying that not too spicy dim sum also works very well with the Chenin Blanc. And that, again, I think that slight ripeness in the Chenin can work really well with things like, you know, coriander and ginger, soya and so on. So I could imagine that the dim sum would be nice with the Chenin. You think so, guys? Oh, yeah. Great. Really? Yeah. And then someone's saying that the rosy is absolutely delightful. Don't normally drink rosy, I think, but they really enjoy it. And the thing is, it's lovely and crisp and fresh, the rosy. Um, I love the rosy since I discovered it when celebrating the birth of my son in the summer of 2019. I'll now add the Shannon, to, Shannon blog to my list of go-to wines. Very drinkable. Well, that's great. You've already got a fan in the rosy and you're adding um, some Shannon blog onto the, onto the repertoire. I, it's so easy. 
you know, even for me, and I taste a lot of wines um, in my job of buying wines for Brian's, so easy to keep buying the same wine again and again, just because you like it. And um, it's, we're all the same. So it's, uh, it's good to find something else to add to the, to the repertoire. Um, so that's um, definitely worth joining the tasting. We tried the fresh strawberry summer salad with the rosé, absolutely gorgeous. And the strawberry salad was a recommendation from Roloff and Victor. So I'd like to know what um, a fresh summer strawberry salad is at Delheim. What are the ingredients for that at Delheim? Well, Victor, it's your, it's your mother's kitchen. The ingredients for strawberry salad. Sure. Yeah. Um, I know that different... might sound a weird one, but I'm curious to know what it would be with you guys. Um, definitely the sour cream and as many different types of salad you can add. And then some okay. nut, nuts and some nuts. All right. So it's basically leaves, strawberries, sour cream and nuts and as many bits of garden salad that you can add into that. Yeah. Yeah, and then so obviously you, your olive oil and your things to taste if you want to, but that's, mm. yeah, that's your. Sounds nice. Good use of strawberries as well for a change. Sounds delicious. And then um, Chenin Blanc is fabulous with sushi, which sounds delicious as well. And the Chenin Blanc with this shashimi, shashimi, which is a delicious combination. So gosh, we've got some really adventurous food matches tonight, which is nice. Um, and then someone is saying, Nick is saying, um, 20 year, 24 years ago, we came across the Delheim Vineyard whilst honeymooning in South Africa and had a fantastic morning with the team. The vineyard was very homely and the team were very welcoming. That's lovely. That's nice that Thank you've got you. someone joining well, tonight that's we'll actually, that. someone that's actually visited you in South Africa, which is great. And um, Sheila was saying that herself and her husband also visited Delheim on their honeymoon 13 years ago, and it was fabulous. Gosh, you guys are the destination for honeymooners, then. So We've had a thank few you. of those. We've had people getting engaged here as well. Oh, really? In the vineyard. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you for joining the tasting, guys. And I'm glad that um, it's nice that you can join the tasting where you've actually been to the property and experienced it firsthand. So then I think we'll move on then to our wine number three, which is the Chardonnay. So um, this is the Chardonnay Sur Lee. And again, a bit like we said that the rosé was um, one of the earliest rosés that was made in South Africa, going back to 1974 in Stellenbosch. Then this Chardonnay, the Sur Lee, is almost like a cult wine style at this stage. So, Victor, when was this Sir Lee Chardonnay? When was this first made? Oh, we made the first one with um, Conrad Flock. It was the wine. No, it was, sorry, with um, Brenner van It was the wine maker. Okay. And at the time, we wanted to experiment with Chardonnay, but make, try not to become anything but Chardonnay. Um, okay. Uh, saying that you don't want all that terrible, uh, that over oakiness, the where people start chewing the oak or getting the splinters in their mouth. And to be experimented with fresh, uh, with um, French oak. And um, yeah, and because uh, Chardonnay seems to really give an amazing concentration of fruit um, up here on the Delam slopes. Um, we've, we met uh, one of the, oh, see, I can not even, do you remember which vintage won the international wine spirit competition? The 14. 14. So we won the best Chardonnay in the world award with the with the wine vintage. And okay. um, I think that just gave us the the confidence to say that to, what we do with the grapes and the vineyards and the terroir up here works. Um, it's now just for the winemaker to be able to keep um, yeah, to put that into the bottle. And it was it was more that uh, do not make the mistake that we've done before with Chardonnay. Let's try and make, and that's what we said. Let's go into a Sir Lee style. Okay, okay. And um, Roloff, why don't you explain to us then the Sir Lee style? Because it's a very specific style of winemaking, isn't it? Yeah, um, and I think it's it's also 
it, it helps more about the identity from where it's from. Um, like I've pointed out in the beginning, identity is very important to me. Um, and that overlaps with my wood philosophy and my wood regime. Um, I heard this phrase once. I still can't remember who said it until I find out I'm going to pretend as if I made it up. Um, <laughs> I want wood to be the bass player of a band. When it's playing, you don't hear it. But when it's not playing, you miss it. Um, okay. I, don't, I don't think um, French terroir should feature in South African wine. I want you to taste South African grapes. You know, and uh, wood should kind of just lift that fruit up and not completely throw a blanket over it. And then you smell it and you say, oh, you know, this is limousine barrels from France. I want you mm -hmm. to taste Dallin Chardonnay in your glass. So that is very important to me. And I think in a certain style of wine that we make, um, having it on the lease, um, bringing the new wood down to 5%, um, and also Excuse using larger. <laughs> French oak barrels, it really just um, complements the fruit so much more. Um, and then the magic, <laughs> I use the word magic, the, the, the whole idea behind Surly is the time it spends on its lease. And Chardonnay is one of those cultures that just lends itself to maturing in barrel for, for oh, a long time, nine to 12 months even. In a Chenin Blanc, I would start thinking about you know, after six months where Chardonnay, it's just, you know, it can go longer, no problem, no sulfur. It gets body, it, it, it just becomes this wine that almost embodies everything you've done in the vineyards. And I don't think Victor mentioned it enough, but the site that we've got now on the Simonsburg slopes, I mean, there's so much thought that went behind it, how to plant, where to plant it. They did heat maps. They know exactly the site is this sort of temperature, you know, the slope, the road direction, everything goes into those sorts of things so that when I get the fruit into the cellar, all I really have to do is crush it, put it into barrel, let it do its own thing. Um, and it, it's also, it boils down to just, you know, knowing what you want to do going forward and having the right, um, let's say, pairing material to work with. So it's, it's just, uh, it's, a, it's a fun and easy wine to make because the fruit is just that good. And the Chardonnay, certainly, I think for the last, I'm going to say, 20, 20, 30 odd years, it's just been phenomenal and it just shows what we can do in Stellenbosch. Uh, the terroirs there, the decomposed granite soil just lends itself to the Chardonnay. Um, sometimes I, you know, I, I always imagine that we've got limestone in the soil because I pick up this minerality that mm. you don't get on the other sections in Stellenbosch, but you get it on Dalheim. It's just unique. Um, and now why would you want to go and hide that with French oak barrels? It just doesn't make sense to me. I, it, we get the splintiness. We get from. I mean, the only thing that I really get from the oak is this this kind of light smokiness that just comes through. But I mean, it's all for me. It's lemon zest. It's lime. It's it's what we call it modern burgundy. It's yeah, really it's very fresh, gorgeous acidity, really tingling, zingy palate. And yeah. would you mind explaining what surly is? Just because not everyone would necessarily know what um, Sur Lee is in terms of winemaking? So basically, uh, after fermentation, the yeast well, it, it almost kills itself and sinks to the bottom of the, the vessel that you're fermenting. And over time, what we also do is we batonage a little bit. We do batonage in the beginning, about, let's say, twice a week. And after a month, it tapers down to once every two weeks, and then it tapers down just on taste. If I think it's becoming a bit too to date of our uh, batonage, but it's, it's already on taste. And then in that process, the yeast cells actually burst and release manoproteins into the wine, which gives it body, which gives it that, that fat feeling, that oiliness. Uh, so so Lee is pretty much it's time spent on the lease, the, the bed of lease. I think that that's okay. the direct contact. So time, time spent on the, or it's the wine in contact with the spent yeast lees and batonage is the stirring of those lees through the wine. It's just mixing it, mixing up the mm. yeast so that it gets back into the wine. And I mean, the wine, if you look at your glass now, the wine, the yeast, and the, everything settles down and it's clear, almost as clear as what it is in the bottle. And then when you mix it up, it almost becomes murky that you can't even see through the wine. And that's just the mm -hmm. yeast going back up and then over time it settles out again. So it is, it is a, it's a process and it, you've got to kind of, it's 100% on taste. You taste, you say, okay, this wine's had enough butternose, this wine hasn't, this wine, you know, it still needs a bit more body. You kind of, 
see what you get get into the wine. You, you can overdo it very easily. And if you don't do it enough, the wine becomes oxidated. So you've got to really find a balance. And uh, that's probably the perk of my job that I get to taste wine every day. Um, and mm. get paid so it, it definitely oh. is something you, you, we put a lot of focus on getting it right. Um, mm. And yeah, I mean, what I'm trying to put into the bottle, it's, it's, we're getting there. I think we still got so much potential at Dalheim. It's unreal. The vineyard team, mm. we're just so focused at the moment. Um, like I said, we're, we're thinking 2023, 2024 and how we're developing things already. So it's, 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 it's a fun time to be yeah. in the South African wine industry. And how old did you say the Chardonnay vineyards are? Well, this block is now, I think it's seven or seven years. Okay. Yeah, seven, eight it's years remarkable old. then, isn't it? Because those are still quite young vines. Yeah. But but you've you know, still got that intensity and concentration there in the wine. Yeah. I mean, look, it's it's as old as we, we've been making wine in South Africa for more than 360 odd years. Mm. Um, but with apartheid and, 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 and we've been isolated from the world's technology, the world's advancement, the world's you know, we were so stuck in this little bubble and now with, we've got the University of Stellenbosch, we've got all these ideas, we get foreign interns, we go outside to go see what they're doing. That information is just coming to us and we've now literally because we can plant whatever we want, wherever we want, we've got the opportunity. And this is a, a site where, you know, they've done the research, they've seen the heat maps, they've seen the slope, they've seen, okay, this piece of land, it is perfect for Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And then if you mm. can do that, you can achieve quality and success in a relatively shorter time than what it would be to plant a vineyard X here and mm. over 30, 40 years, you're now developing the fruit that you would have. Because you've done the soil analysis and so on. Exactly, yeah. Okay, interesting. So Kira was saying that she's not a Chardonnay fan, but this wine has bowled her over. And I think, you know, we do hear that quite a lot. I think that Chardonnay, it's like a chameleon grape variety. Chardonnay can be crisp, fresh, high acid, quite aromatic, very light and very fresh, or it can be at the other end of the scale, which is textural, creamy, concentrated and powerful. So there's all styles of Chardonnay out there. So for people who think that they don't like Chardonnay, they just need to keep trying Chardonnay because there's one out there for you because the, one of the reasons why it's such a widely planted grape variety around the world is because it grows easily, but also it's a grape that does what you tell it once it gets into the cellar. So the winemaker has a big influence on how a Chardonnay ends up in the bottle. And this is at the richer, more concentrated, fuller end of the Chardonnay scale. But I think it's absolutely fantastic and actually represents fantastic value for money because you are, um, a, you know, absolute premium Chardonnay with oak and with power and concentration. And um, Kira was also saying she had it with the smoked brisket, which was actually, again, um, our, was actually a food match that came, the smoked um, brisket was a food match that came from the winery um, because we're trying very much to go with what the winery are suggesting. Um, and smoked salmon was also recommended for this wine. So if anyone had um, this was smoked salmon, I think it would have also been nice because you've got the acidity to cut through the oil and the salmon, and then you've got the richness of the flavor to match with the salmon. So I think that sounds like um, a nice match. That, and as we mentioned earlier, it's the stirring of the spent yeast lees in the wine, and that actually gives um, more intensity of flavor, a bit textural, and the yeast actually protects the wine from oxidation as well. So it has a various purposes, but it would be a very common practice and say, um, Burgundy, where they're making um, also making top end Chardonnays, that and would be a technique that's often used with Chardonnay. Um, so, um, Victor, you mentioned, or Roloff mentioned apartheid there, but you were saying just at the start of the call, the situation in um, South Africa at the moment is quite difficult because you're in your fourth lockdown and alcohol sales have been completely banned in South Africa at the moment, haven't they? Yes. So, so we, we, we allow to export, so your uh -huh. Irish orders are going, but um, locally we cannot sell you know, off, on consumption or off consumption. And the restaurants are open, but um, yeah, you cannot have any alcohol there. Okay. So, no, so nobody's going to go to a restaurant if you can't have alcohol in any case. No. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, the thing in the in, in earlier on this year in the I don't know which lockdown it was. I think it might have been your first lockdown. Um, actually, the government stopped exports of wine as well. So we were very, very, very light on stock of wine from South Africa, and you would be our main winery. So um, we basically almost ran out of South African wine at a certain point this year, just because of the the export ban, if you like, which must yeah. have been uh, must have been. How long did the export ban last for in the lockdown? Well, the first lockdown, uh, I think it was about three weeks, perhaps. And then they realized that if they don't open it up, it's going to make an absolute disaster for the wine industry. Okay. We export we export about 50% of our wine. Okay. Um, well, that will mean 50% of our income will just come. Uh, so then it'll be 100% of our income come to a total standstill. Okay. Um, that's doing no business for three months. Um, that would just have killed most wineries. Yeah. No, so absolutely. The, small, the smaller wineries who were not exporting, who had no export base, um, they were only dependent on the local market. They were really having a hard time, and a lot of um, under counter um, activities, activities started to happen. Yeah. And on the Chardonnay, it's quite interesting. Um, we always kind of imagine that wine is endless and we can have as much as we want, but on the Delham Chardonnay, um, when Paul and I and Kevin go to meet no your sister Nora in Provine to do our tastings and buy our wine and so on, um, Nora's always very strict about the amount of Chardonnay that we're allowed to buy because it's not, you don't have endless quantities of it. And I know that there's a big following for it in Ireland. So um, we're delighted to um, have it here. And you were telling us tonight yeah. to order loads of rosé because the Germans are ordering it up like mad. So you're saying we need to book some stock on the rosé. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think it's, it's um, rosé especially has grown for us a lot, but Chardonnay and uh, the Chenin Blanc Wild Ferment is sort of a bit of surprise kits for us because um, the world has uh, um, invited embraced Chardonnay again, but they want that kind of Chardonnay style. Mm. Um, we've seen the same with Chenin Blanc. Chenin Blanc was just so difficult because everybody just wanted to have Sauvignon Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc. Um, mm. And then people started to get a bit tired of the acidity of Sauvignon Blanc, and um, and it, I don't. It, it's for us in our area. It's very difficult to do a Sauvignon Blanc because of viticultural reasons, not winemaking reasons so much. But Chardonnay and Chenin Blanc do really well in our, and and I think that's what we need to focus. We need to focus mm -hmm. on what we can do well in our wine growing era in our terroir, and not try and copy other people because. Terroir you can't copy. The Chinese can't mm. take the terroir from South Africa and go make our wines in China. So that's the advantage we have as wine producing countries that we mm. are, have good, unique terroirs. Mm. And um, yeah, so those varieties, those two white varieties work very well for us. Are you too hot in Stellenbosch to grow Sauvignon Blanc? We are too hot. So we get mm. a lot of um, Utaipa in our um, vines, which means it's uh, wood starts rotting. Um, so it's a kind of uh, trunk disease. Yes, and so after about eight to 10 years, you have to cut back your vineyard completely and start all over. Okay. I'll say it's, pretty, it's pretty much like building your, paying your, heart, your bond off your house, um, which you, it's gonna take 20 years and on the 10th year, you decide to break down half your house and rebuild it. You know. It's, it's, it's a never ending story and um, mm. it just becomes too expensive. Mm. Okay. Thank you for that. So, on that um, sad note, we're going to move on to Pinotage then. <laughs> we'll focus again on the wines. So, the first, well, the, the red wine that we're having this evening is the Pinotage um, 2017. And is this 100% Pinotage roll off? Yeah. Okay. So, should we talk through the Pinotage then? Yeah, sure. Um, see it very well. Um, well, uh, you need to South Africa. Uh, a lot has changed in the sort of last 40 years of, of the making of Pinotage. Um, if you had to go back in time and see what they did back in the 90s, in the 80s, uh, even probably early 2000s, um, it was always tried to be made as, as this big, massive red wine. Um, as South Africans, we love big red wines because I don't know if it's maybe you just get more for your buck, but we have this culture of drinking big red wines. So we've, we've always made Pinotage in this 
you know, extract as much as what you possibly can, big, ripe pinotages. And um, I think the younger winemakers, including myself, I guess I can call myself young. So we approach it in kind of in a different way. And if you look at the makeup of the, of the pinotage where its parents plant is Pinot Noir and Hermitage Sinso, one of the, the two most delicate cultivars out there, uh, when they created pinotage, you, you wonder why are we treating this like a cabernet almost where we're just trying to smash it and extract, extract, extract. So with what's in the, available in the wineries nowadays, technology and how we can analyze and, you know, we extract the finer things. We, we're really trying to make a pinotage express itself a lot more elegantly at the moment. Um, it has a lot of a lot to offer. I think our neighbors, Aubrey Beerslop and Penonkop, I think he described it best. A, a good pinotage has the aromatics of a Pinot Noir in the body of a cabinet. It's just, and that's what it can do. And that's really what it can do. Mm. You know, if you if you taste, you know, where, where, when you find where things should be in the terroir sense, uh, where you know Cabernet, Blanc, Bordeaux, and Syrah, and in South Africa, in Stellenbosch, we're still experimenting. But if you start looking at the overall makeup of where the best pinotages come from, you'll see in Stellenbosch, it always ends up from the Simons back. I mean, that's where we are, and it's, it, it always ends up to have the same characteristics where we have bush vines, southwest facing slopes, uh, and uh, it, you know, if that works with Pinotage, and that's what we've been doing. And I think that's really the su success story of our Pinotage, purely because mm. we have to get the right place. Um, and then you've got such an array of vineyards. You've got bush vine vineyards, you've got trellis vineyards, you've got really old vineyards, you've got really young vineyards. So, you know, I've got such a, a broad spectrum of Pinotages to play with when making this wine. So um, I mentioned earlier, it is a very, very fast fermenting cultivar. So we get it in. We never, we do harvest all by hand. Uh, we never really stress to pick until five in the afternoon. We really just pick till, say, just after lunch, maybe sometimes. So we never really get the fruit in hot. It's always nice and cool. Uh, we get it straight into the fermentation vessels. For this pinotage, like I said, it's a lot of different vineyards. And we've also got different fermentation vessels in the southern side. I do upright fermentation, stainless steel. I do open top fermentations with punch downs. Um, I've even got, uh, horizontal tanks that rotate so i try to do a bit of everything just to get different layers again like almost like the shannon blanc where i just you know i want to have as many golden blocks at the beginning when i'm making up this blend yes it's an individual culture but it is one pinotage you know made up of lots of different little pinotages so pinotage ferments really quick so for any other red wine where you've got two weeks of fermentation extraction you've got to kind of shrink that into the three four days that it ferments it. so it's a lot more hands-on, more time gets spent over the short period of time to really get this, this wine right, get the right color, get the right body, get the right texture. And uh, again, we do punch downs, we do pump overs four to five uh, times a day. Um, it really also goes by taste. I mean, it's, it's, it's something you just have to pay attention to in a small period of time. And then from there, we'll do malolactic fermentation, French oak barrels. Uh, we mature it from 12 to 18 months, depends on the batch. And then, I mean, some of the barrels, after eight months, I'll take it out and I'll put it into our bigger food ray wooden tanks um, for the next half of its maturation. So there's a lot of different things we do with the pinotage. And um, it's all based on this vineyard block tends to give us more of this characteristic, that vineyard block a bit more of that. That blends itself better to French oak barrels. This will do better than 500 meter French oak barrels. You know, so there's a lot of thought that goes in the, in into crafting this wine. And then at the end of the day, we sit around the table and we do the blends and we see what works. And how many, how many different plots of pinotage do you vinify? Well, it's, uh, at the moment, I think for this pinotage, five or six different blocks. Okay, okay. So, so Lynn, this is where the winemaker has to work and the viticulturist doesn't have to do much. <laughs> pinotage is a very easy, growing variety um, but from a winemaking point it is quite challenging and I think that's why South Africa stuffed it up in the early years um, with Pinotage that we just couldn't get it right and we were we our wines were called anything from burnt rubber to um, what other names do they give it sorry rusty nails rusty nails stuff and and um, I think that's where we've We've worked hard to get 
the Pinotage fruit to show, but it is, it's a winemaking. It's a, I say because we have the leaf roll virus in South Africa, which is when you drive through the vineyards here in um, after the harvest, you get the leaves turning red. And that is not because it's becoming autumn. That's because there's a vir virus in the actual leaves causing the chlorophyll to go to, to, to stop producing and allowing the, telling the, basically shutting the factory down of the, of the vineyard, not allowing the grapes to produce more sugar. So Pinotage, because it's an early ripening variety, we always can ripen it properly in the vineyard. It's, it, it hasn't got a problem. With it. Whereas with Cabernet, when you have leaf oil virus and Cabernet, it's a late ripening variety it's a very big challenge to ripen it properly if you've got too much leaf roll in your vineyard. Um, Canoncop always laughs and says they don't, they don't have a problem with leaf roll virus because Pinotage is just such an early variety, it always ripens. And does leaf roll start photosynthesis? 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 Yes. It does, right? So, so, it's so a the vine's that... nutrition is being affected with leaf roll virus. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, the later ripening cultivars really struggle, like Cabernet with, with uh, leaf roll really struggles to reach its sugar potential, or its uh, alcohol potential towards the back end of ripening. Uh, because it's at the end of the, 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 the end. season of the year sort of thing. And almost all the, all the leaves are pretty much shut down where Pinotage, for example, because it's an early ripening cultivar, it's still in a different phase. Okay, uh, okay. So, and you're in autumn there now, aren't you? So I suppose if you have leaf roll virus, then, you know, the, if you have healthy grapes, even after the harvest, the vines can still take a lot of nutrient through the sun with photosynthesis. And if the grapes are, or the, the leaves are sick, it means that that lovely period in the autumn that the, the grapes can actually store some reserves Maybe they can't do it so much if they've got leaf roll. Would that be fair? That's quite correct. Mm. So that's where you that's where you from a viticulture point of view then have to to manipulate the vineyard differently, either by mm. adding um, uh, chemistry to the leaves um, to actually help them to to carry on photosynthesis for longer. Um, but if you you cannot fight the virus once it's in the plant, it's in there. Mm. Is you can't kill it with a with a chemical. Mm. I mean, I think the pinotage is absolutely beautiful, and I, I think that um, what's interesting, as you say, the color aroma profile is quite similar to Pinot Noir. It's quite delicate and it's floral and so on, and the tannin is there, but the tannin is very ripe and it's very integrated. I think it's a beautifully um, balanced glass of red wine. I think Rulof can tell you what he thinks of it, but we try not to go and do an overripe style. We don't try and do the mm -hmm. jammy, chocolatey mm -hmm. kind of styles. I think we do a more elegant um, style on Pinot Tars where we would like to show the, the family, which is Pinot Noir, that's part of the family of Pinot Tars, um, but in the character of the wine. Mm. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think for me, great red wines are, are elegantly powerful. Um, and this is elegantly powerful, yeah. Really what you want, you, all yeah. the expression, but you don't want it to just sit down something. You want it to be mm. a beautiful drinking wine as well. Um, I mean, we talk about this a lot at work because there's a lot of conversation around the alcohol levels in wine. And this is 14%, which sounds like a scary level of alcohol. But the reality is that if you're in a warm country or a warm wine growing region, the grapes ripen, the sugars are higher, and the fermentation is going to pr produce more alcohol. For me, the most important thing is when we're looking at a wine is not, you know, say the alcohol or specific levels of acidity. It's the fact that it's balanced on the palate and that everything works together. So the fruit, the acidity, the tannin level, if it's a red wine, that the structure of the whole, the overall palate is what's important. And when you taste this wine, you wouldn't get any sensation of 14% alcohol at all because there's enough fruit, there's enough acidity, there's enough other concentration of flavors that everything's beautifully balanced. And I think that, um, 
you know, this is the perfect example of um, elegant power, as you say. Yeah. Um, so uh, Kevin is asking when the best is the best time to visit um, your winery. So we were just saying it's an 11 hour flight from London. I don't know. Can we fly direct from Dublin? I can't really remember at the moment. And then, sorry? You'll have to go to Johannesburg. All so right. Okay. Just quick, it, in any other time, yes. But now the laws are, they want everyone to land in Johannesburg and then fly from Johannesburg to Cape Town. All right. And then it's a, there's an hour's difference in the time. So we are currently 10 past eight in Dublin and you're 10 past nine in Stellenbosch. So what's the flying time from Joburg to Stellenbosch? Two hours. Two hours? Two hours. Okay. All right. One, one hour and, 15 or something like that. And tell me, when is the best time to come to South Africa to visit you guys? Now That's they know tourists. Think... You, have, you have freedom of, <laughs> of that line. Yeah, you can come and drink as much wine as you want. There's nobody else here. <laughs> you have all our attention. <laughs> But time of year, you know, is it May or is it, um, spring. you know, spring? I okay. think uh, from the nicest time, for, I enjoy February? I don't know, Ru Rulof probably disagrees with me, but I think yeah, the that, nicest that, time for me would be October, November. Okay. Yeah, that is quite nice. I mean, I'd, I'd, if you're very into wine and want to see what we're doing at the back end of harvest, you come March, March, April, you still get to see what we're doing in the winery. There's still fermentations going on, but that's very wine orientated. Um, but I think Victor's right, spring is probably the better time. Or unless okay. you really need to hustle and bustle December, January, when the rest of the world is here, and there's just a good okay. atmosphere. If you, if, you, if you can choose a time, I would say October, November, because then the South Africans are not on holiday. Okay. Um, and it's all uh, December is, is a too crazy. It's a crazy season. January is also crazy, and then February is extremely hot. Um, okay. So then you're yeah, like March, April. Then again, that would be a good time. Okay, perfect. Okay, so someone saying that the um, Pinot Tarsh has a Pinot Noir nose, and that um, as John O'Toole said, he had it with the, some beef stew earlier. Um, so that sounds good. And then the duck is on the barbecue, which, which was the recommendation from you guys, that it was duck breast with the pinotage, which you can imagine would be absolutely delicious. Um, so they're going to be enjoying their duck in about an hour's time with the pinotage. Um, and then Sheila's saying, it's a beautiful drive on the garden route from Stellenbosch to Johannesburg. So um, everyone seems to be getting in the mood to come out and visit you guys. <laughs> We can't go anywhere at the moment, so we're, we, we've got to we've got to dream at the moment of what we're going to do. That in fact the um, the COVID um, passports have started to arrive with people this week, um, so we're going to be able to start travelling at some point soon, hopefully. Drink um, enough South African wine now, and you come and visit next time. Okay, yeah, we can drink and dream at the moment, <laughs> and use your food matches. So um, Olga was saying that we visited your fabulous vineyard in November and a few years ago, and it was absolutely fabulous and enjoyed tasting the wines again tonight. The duck recommendation has worked very well, Jeff was saying. Um, we have to be in, it will have to be in November 22, 2022 from Kevin, because we won't be allowed to travel this year. I think that's possibly a fair enough observation. Um, Okay, Owen is asking, lines or spring box? What's your call? I'm handing over here. This isn't about well, wine, I, I, this is about I'll, rugby. I'll beat him, Thrash, well, in Thrash. We, we beat the, the Lions quite comfortably last night, so I can only imagine our full strength side will, will demolish them. There I think go. the Irish should just come here because they'll give us a thrashing problem. The Irish will <laughs> be better than the Lions, definitely. <laughs> Much better than the Lions. <laughs> Okay. Um, how long before drinking the pinotage would you re recommend uncorking the bottle? Yeah, I think, you know, I don't, I don't think it needs to be decanted. Um, okay. At the moment, it's drinking beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, yeah, uh, an hour or two just to... Okay. Just open it up. Let it breathe. Yeah, let it breathe. I don't, it's a wine, I think it's just at the moment, just drinking really, really well. Uh, what's it now? It's a 20, 
four years later, three years later, it's, it's definitely just drinking it. It will probably last another three to five years and then we'll start developing okay. the other characteristics. But yeah, drink it now. Open the bottle. Okay. Open it and drink it. Okay. More and more wines are being made for drinking, really, as opposed to keeping or um, to enjoy and access the fruit at the moment. Okay, don't, so... Don't want to die from COVID and you can't drink it. <laughs> That's a bit cheerful, Victor. I was, I was nearly dead from COVID, so I, did, I was... I did, yeah, missed all my, all my old wines were lying there. <laughs> oh, really? Did you, when did you have COVID, Victor? I had the 4th of January. I was in the hospital for 10 days. And I oh, really? Two, people, two guys die next to me, so I was getting very worried about my, my situation. Oh, God. Uh, oh, gosh. I didn't know that. So, so there's always there's always a good reason to drink a wine. Okay. Um, yeah, I didn't know you you had been in hospital with COVID. So sorry to hear that. And you're very you look the I'm picture sorry. of health now. So you're. I, you're I never lost my smell or my taste. So good, yeah. and you're still drinking wine. So yeah. Okay, so if someone said, "If I can resist the Shannon, what's the best way to store it for three days?" <laughs> um, as per Roloff's recommendation. In the fridge, Roloff? In the fridge. I literally just take the cork out, pour a little glass, obviously. I can't resist it either. Put the cork back, just leave it in the fridge. Three okay. days later. We, even, we, we actually implement that in our tasting room to try to keep open one or two or three bottles so that on the second or third day, that's in the cycle when you pour it. And it's just, it works. It's a wine that just opens up beautifully. Okay. Um, uh, all our wines at the moment in South Africa, you recommend uh, should come out of should come out of your fridge. Um, to have a wine standing at room temperature is just stupid because by the time you open the glass, pour it, it's it's back to room. And, and the wine styles, the, the 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 way we make red wines these days, as well as you want to you want to actually smell the fruit, enjoy the fruit. And if the wine is too hot, the alcohol is going to come out first and not the fruit. Mm. Yeah. That's true. It becomes soupy, doesn't it? So that you, you lose the fruit purity if the wine is too hot. And we talk about room temperature wines, but that was in years and years ago when we didn't have central heating. But now room yeah. temperature is much warmer than it ever was in the past. So um, I always say pop out the back door for 10 minutes or in the hall or somewhere that's less warm in the house, particularly for the reds anyway. But I would think this pinotage could honestly be popped in the fridge for 20 minutes as well. If it was, I mean, it's, it's okay. warm here today and it's been warm all week. And I, the freshness would be lifted if it was in the fridge for 10 minutes or 20 minutes. Would you agree, Roloff? 100%. I mean, just yeah. the way we approach it now. I mean, if you just, if you think of cultivars like Simsa, you put in your fridge because you can drink it. Yeah. Cold. yeah. Uh, it, and it lends itself so much to that character or that style of wine. That yeah. definitely, um, I wouldn't drink it ice cold like a Sauvignon Blanc or a Shen, but just no. relatively cooler than what you would normal red take, wine. Just take it down slightly, which will lift the fruit in the nose and on the palate and lift the purity. So yeah. someone's saying, we're planning a trip to South Africa and your vineyard is on the itinerary. Lovely wine, thank you. We're heading in yeah. May next year and Delheim is already on our list. So looking forward to visiting again. That's Dara. And then Jeff is saying, thrashed is harsh. You were supposed to turn up with your test side. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I ask if you would recommend decanting the white or the rosé wine? Uh, maybe not the rosé, the white. Yeah, why not? Uh, I think instead of three yeah. days, at least try to decant it. Mm. Might get some. And also the color, the color of the white. It's a. It's quite a. Um, it's quite a luxurious color of white. So it would actually look really nice in a decanter. Mm. That I think that, that I talk about this quite a lot is decanting rosé just for the fun because it looks nice, but decanting more textured whites just because they can cope with being decanted because of the there's more going on in terms of aromas and, and palate. So um, Angela is saying she's raising a glass to you, Victor. And... Yes. O'Brien's have a Delheim um, Grand Reserve, which is worth the splurge for a special treat. And I would completely agree with you, John. It's absolutely fantastic wine. We didn't have it on this evening because we're trying to keep these tastings um, very accessible in terms of price point and value for money. 
um, but definitely that's well worth trying and um, it's one that you, if you get to the wine festivals when we start them again in 2022, that's always on the table and it's a good opportunity to try that wine at the wine festivals. So I it think- won a um, five star award, so that's uh, uh, for a border, so that thick wine. Oh, did it, five the stars, Grand yeah. Reserve. It's, it's fantastic wine, absolutely fantastic wine. So um, Aaron wants to do, um, Aaron wants to do a, let me just check what Aaron wants to do. I have to go back to the commander and ask. Aaron is going to do a, a poll on the different wines that we've tried this evening um, to see who enjoyed what, which is, um, which is good. But before I hand over to Aaron, um, if anyone has any more questions at all, we'd be very happy to have them. We've heard about the duck, we've heard about the salmon, the sushi and the various matches with the different wines. But if anyone's had any other um, food match that they've enjoyed this evening, then please um, put it in the chat because we'd love to hear from you. And um, love the evening and the wine. Best of luck with the rugby guys. So, <laughs> so Aaron, do I need to do anything? Sorry, I just need to check what, if I've got to do anything. Not sure. Okay, he might be doing it at the very, very end. So in, in terms of, um, you know, what's the next thing in wine in South Africa, Victor? What do you think? Where is the South African industry going? I think um, we are definitely decreasing in our planted vineyards in South Africa. Um, our biggest wine producer, Destel, has just sold most of their farms, um, which are um, wines like your Alto, Tassenberg, um, uh, labels that have been around for a long time. So I think it's, it's a time for the smaller producer who focused on quality, good value for money with the quality, um, great experience on the estate. Um, that, yeah, I think we are seeing it definitely that people are focusing and spending their money rather on quality and value for money than just because it's a product that everybody else drinks. Um, I think that the the with the product the, the for vine area decreasing in South Africa, the competition's going to get um, the, the sorry the prices per for grapes will go up and hopefully we'll get a bit more money for our wine because that at the moment is a big struggle in South Africa. Now, the, the grape producer, the primary producer is not making money and they're going under. Okay. So it's, it's for us as a winery who has um, vineyards of our own who grow and grapes who are not reliant on, on outside grapes. It's for us opportunities to start planting um, again um, new vineyards, younger vineyards, um, so that we have a proper rotation um, with vineyards that are on average about 10 to 12 years old, because that's where the quality lies. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I think for the quality producer in the top range, I think South Africa is it's looking promising. If you are only growing grapes for bulk wine, um, I think that's, that's not going to be easy going forward. So basically, if you're in charge of your own vineyard, you're, you've got your own destiny in your own hands. But if you're buying grapes to make wine or whatever, it's a harder, a harder job, really. Yeah. And you're in charge of the quality in the vineyard and you're in, chal chal you're, you're in charge of sort of end to end piece from vineyard through to final bottle. So you've got everything under your own. Rulof came to, to Delheim with half the salary that he got at the other place because he said our grapes are not terrible, are so good that he just has to be here. So, I mean, <laughs> it's close to the truth. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> I think that's I think that's that's for a winemaker important. I mean, a winemaker at the end of the day, he, he can he can't make a great one from shit grapes, but he he can make a bad wine from good grapes. Um, so at the end of the day, it, the challenge lies in the vineyard. And Rulof said it earlier on that if, if, if we own the terroir and we can manage our fruit, it's just up to us to, to get it to mm. the consumer. Um, yeah. In the, yeah. In, in, and another thing, um, just to add with 
you know, there's a surplus of wine in the world and a lot of vineyards are being pulled out. It's not just a South African thing. Um, it's just give, put us in a scenario where focus is so terribly important in what you do. Uh, you don't now have the luxury of just planting what you need Merlo here because you can. And you've got to now know what you're doing, why you're doing it and be focused. And I think the, the biggest problem with South African wine is the fact that the quality is going up, but the price point is just staying behind. Mm. You're really looking to get out of the bank for your buck category. Mm. Um, will we ever? I don't know. But uh, the focus, you're now competing with so many more people that are just upping their game because you can't mm. just make what average wine yeah. anymore. Uh, there's just too much in the world. So yeah. it, quality is the focus, I think, for every single winery in Stalinbosch. Uh, I can't think of some other, even those co-ops are now starting to realize all game is, is very dangerous. It's about quality at the moment. Mm. Um, I know you're very, you're the viticulturalist um, that's kind of in your remit, um, Victor. So, um, shit grapes, that's a technical term, is it? <laughs> <laughs> you got that one right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's a question here from Nick asking, um, not necessarily just the wine this evening, but what are your favorite varietals tonight so which of each of the guys favorite delheim wine not just the four wines from tonight so what's your favorite wine victor of your range i've got three kids and i love them equally but i always, i don't always like them equally so that's probably the same thing i need to say about my wines eh? okay you mean that's it's so i think yes yeah, so, i mean it's it's a time of the year as well that you're drinking, uh -huh. that you enjoy drinking certain styles. But um, you should love every wine because if you don't love it, you should never bottle, put it in a bottle. Yeah. Okay. And Rolo, your favorite wine? Do you have a favorite child? <laughs> <laughs> no, I love, um, I spent a lot of time in France making wine there. I've just always, I've this love for Bordeaux, uh, Bordeaux reds. Um, so Grand Reserve naturally is one of the reasons why I came to Dalaheim. Mm. Okay, fair enough. He's, he's I... lying because he's a, he's, a, he's a very good noble late harvest detritus um, winemaker. And he's, from his previous winery, he made the donkeys buy as well. And mm. um, I think he's got a secret love affair there as well. <laughs> it's Bordeaux. <laughs> it's Bordeaux. It's Bordeaux. Okay. Um, no, we make really nice noble late. In fact, if I have a few minutes, a few seconds, I'll quickly say we've got, I, I, if you had to tell me, ask me today, would I ever plant Riesling in Stellenbosch? I'd tell you out of your mind. But we have this one block of Riesling. It's called the office block. It's right next to the office. And it's freezing cold in Dalheim, always. Uh, uh -huh. Because there's a pocket in the Simonsburg where the sun really only hits us from 11 o'clock in the afternoon, winter even later. Um, there's fog in the morning. It, it sounds miserable, but it's actually not that bad. But it's just mm. really cold, and it's the ideal condition for botrytis to thrive. And that block of wrestling, it's it's a magnet for botrytis. We just get unbelievable noble late. So we do make it really, really good. So vineyard, it's location, 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 isn't it? And then winemaker. And then winemaking, absolutely. <laughs> so, so, but you're the one roll off that's been telling us all night is you're not doing anything. They just the grapes are so good. <laughs> the boss is here. <laughs> anyway, um, a food suggestion with the Chenin Blanc, Brie de Mo cheese, olives, and grapes sounds delicious. Other suggestion here is the pork medallions with cream cider sauce is going very nicely with the Chardonnay Sir Lee, which sounds gorgeous. Angela's saying she was Chardonnayed out, but was surprised how much she enjoyed the Chardonnay and the Pinotage hit the spot. And that's actually coming from over from the UK because we had some guests tonight joined us from the UK. They went out into the UK and found some Delheim wines in the UK. And one of their relatives here in Ireland arranged for them to get the link. So we've actually got someone on the call from the UK tonight, which I'd forgotten about. So you're very welcome. It's difficult to vote when the wines all taste different. Did everyone see the vote, Aaron? Sorry. Can I just check if people can see the results of the vote? I'll be honest. Um, I think that um, you could do the same thing tomorrow night and you would get completely different results. 
I think wine is always about the occasion, it's about the weather, it's about the food, it's about the company. So tonight, anyway, the wild ferment has won out at with 33%, and the Chardonnay Sur Lee 26, and the Pinotage 23. And interestingly enough, the Rosé 18 tonight, which I was surprised because quite often the Rosés are the most popular. But we've had some amazing food matches tonight, and I think that you know, the, in a way, the, the wines, the, the Chardonnay, the Chenin and the Pinotage have probably gone really well with different dishes. Um, give Roloff a pale eyes that John has sent that to you, Victor. <laughs> I'm directing that to you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll remember that. <laughs> Beautiful wines, great information on the video and from Victor and Roloff, lovely evening. Cheers to Victor. And then do you make any sweet wine? You do. Edis yeah, but... which we actually stock in O'Brien's. No, I've got a, got a five star as well, three times now. For okay. South African Noble Aid. So, if, no, and, and I, I find a lot of people are doing Noble Aids again in South Africa, well, for my friends. And it's something really nice to have after dinner with your, with a goat's cheese. A local, I mean, you've got great sharp cheeses. And um, Noble Aids, I've been, it's, it's a forgotten wine style, but mm. it's coming no. back again, we see it. Okay, um, Alexander says his wife loves the pink. Thank you for a wonderful evening. Amazing wines. Roll up worked in France. Withdraw the pear eyes. UK garden. <laughs> um, so the, some gubby and cheese, which is an Irish cheese with the pinotage, is beautiful. Surprised at the result. Would have expected to fit the rosé to finish higher, which I, I agree. Thanks for the wonderful evening. Fabulous wines. Keep going, doing what you're doing. Thank you, Victor and Roll off. And that's from Sheila. So listen, we're two minutes over time. Thank you very, very much, guys, for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you guys this evening in Stellenbosch, and we're here in Dublin and around Ireland. Um, we're very grateful to you for joining us. I think the, way, the wines showed beautifully this evening. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. We'll be sending the video out tomorrow, so the link will be there. And um, I hope that you enjoyed the tasting. Our next tasting is with Vina Leda from Chile, which is going to be on the 26th of August. And those tickets are going on sale. I think it's next week or the week after. But anyway, watch this space for the next tasting. But really, what a treat to be talking to Victor and Roloff tonight from Stellenbosch in South Africa. It's been absolutely wonderful. And thank you very much for joining us, guys, from South Africa. And thank you, everybody in Ireland and the UK for um, joining the tasting this evening. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks, Thanks guys. And just one best. last thing, open invite to everyone. You, you can get hold of us through Lynn or you'll find your way to that line. Just mention you were in this place thing, we'll take you around the vineyards and treat you. Thank, so. th thank you for that, because we would definitely, um, we would definitely drop a note to you guys and give you contact details of anyone that wanted to come and visit you. We do that quite a bit. So, and you guys are always wonderful. You're always so welcoming. And um, we definitely will pass on anyone that wants to, wants to come. Um, we'll give, we'll give Rudolf a pay rise. Okay, then you all know. <laughs> <laughs> I think he does deserve it, to be honest. The wines are amazing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, thanks cool. guys. Thanks guys. Super. Bye. Night, Bye. night.